Hello and welcome to uh, APQC's financial management webinar for April 2022 on optimizing working capital through a digital shared service center. Today we have a guest um, presenter, Ryan Burza. He's vice president of Treasury Solutions at JP Morgan and a member of the Treasury and Shared Services Optimi Optimization Solutions team for Asia Pacific. He is based in Manila and works with clients on finance transformation, digitization best practices, and working capital optimization initiatives driven out of shared service centers. Welcome, Ryan. Good morning, Megan, and thank you for the introduction. I know it's a it's quite a handful. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who joined us today. You know, I always find it fascinating whenever we come together. Uh, in these forums, because you know, regardless where you are, we we'll always find common ground in these topics that we're gonna be very excited to talk through today. Um, that said, uh, Megan, I'm struggling a little bit with my connection, so I may need some help uh, with flipping through the slides. You got it, Ryan. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so maybe we go um, to the first stage, and what we really wanted to share with you today is, you know, thinking through the past two years, how have some of the corporate um, initiatives really shaped uh, the way we do uh, treasury and finance uh, operation and what we see uh, basically from the industry and what we hear as well in some of our um, client conversation is that digitization is really largely the focus when we think about how we operated uh, in the past two years and how we're trying to make sure that we're being built for the finance operations of the futures. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you know, there are different themes on how uh, corporates have shifted the way that they do treasury and finance operations today, um, all the way from, you know, looking at the way they'll be optimizing working capital to fund some of the uh, capital requirements and liquidity requirements that the pandemic has uh, brought about uh, to, you know, supporting different business models. Um, there's a huge uptick in you know different types of marketplaces um, both in the digital and online types of marketplaces uh, but in today's session uh, what we really wanted to zone in on is accelerating digital transformation uh, I know that's you know quite a buzzword that we hear in the industry quite often but when we um, say you know digitization and you know trying to accelerate your digital transformation, Simply put, it's really, you know, trying to find a more seamless way for corporates to, you know, pay their suppliers, collect from their uh, customers and record these transactions. And, you know, a lot of these um, digitization initiatives that the finance teams typically centralize in the SSC um, are geared towards is supporting your, some of your perennial treasury priorities. Uh, so normally you try to make um, a lot more visible the way uh, that you pay your suppliers and how much you're expecting to collect in the next few uh, days or weeks or months because you're trying to support, you know, your treasury's cash forecasting and you want to understand, you know, what are the amount of funds that are available to the company um, to pay the suppliers in the next few um, weeks and months as well. So that's really, you know, the anchor of um, what we wanted to discuss today. And we also wanted to make it a little bit more uh, interactive. So before we go to the rest of the uh, slides, maybe we'd like to raise a poll question at this juncture. Uh, so to the folks who are um, joining us today, um, you know, a short question. For us in the next slide. Thank you. So we talked about digitization uh, and you know being able to integrate this in your finance processes, but for the folks who joined us today, uh, who would you say is driving your digitization agenda? And for you know for some of our finance practitioners, um, service providers, you can you know share what you hear from your clients as well. Um, is it you know being driven more out of a cross-functional leadership team within SSC? Um, do you feel that this is something that's, uh, you know, done separately by function? And by function here, we say um, specifically between P2P and O2C, they have their own, um, you know, digitization group. Uh, do you feel or do you see that there's a business uh, or operating entity who uh, owns this? Or is there a separate IT organization uh, 
uh, sort of reporting to the CIO who drives this? Um, or do you see that there isn't a formal uh, digitization framework yet? So feel free to um, vote in the poll. Awesome. And here we see, you know, 32% um, of the folks who joined us today see that there's a cross-functional leadership theme within the SCC. Um, and the next being separately by function. Actually, this is a really, really good um, comment and, you know, feedback from the group because of the different conversations and, um, you know, initiatives that we've seen so far, um, being able to have a functional leadership cutting across, you know, the IT team, um, and the business itself and the finance operations tend to be the best way to address uh, digital requirements, right? Because one, you balance, you know, the ability to implement the technology. So the minute you started, you start incorporating the technical um, resources into the conversations, you are able to address, you know, what are the requirements early on. Uh, at the same time, right, you're speaking with the right um, group in terms of business fluency because uh, for some of the uh, more IT centric type of uh, initiatives, it tends to become, you know, a conversation that starts with the technology and the solution first, uh, before you start really digging into what the problem statement is. And that's a really good feedback from from the group. Now, if we go to the meat of what we wanted to share today, right? Um, and the next thank you. Uh, working capital management um, is primarily one of the key areas of um, why an SSE digitizes their processes, right? Um, and there are three broad areas that normally is, um, you know, considered by a shared service center, uh, which they are well placed to, um, you know, to work with. So at the first is they really wanted to make, they really want to make sure that they understand um, where the improvement area is when it comes to the end-to-end -end operating cycle, right? Um, and when we say uh, problem areas, it could be, you know, as early as, um, you know, the way that the sourcing buyers would want to see how much of their spend lies with which suppliers. Um, they want to digitize the way that they invoice their suppliers or receive the invoices from their suppliers. Uh, or it could be at the tail end of you know the operating cycle where uh, you want to understand uh, what are the digital capabilities or electronic capabilities for you to collect from your customer um, and across the operating cycle right across procure to pay in order to cash um, the SSE normally is the one that um, heavily entrenched in these types of processes and they're the ones who understand the you know the nitty-gritty of the problems of each of these um, sub-functions now, a layer be below that is once you've identified, you know, the problem areas on where, you know, your heavy manual transactions um, are, you typically would want to understand um, who's involved um, in these processes, right? Now, obviously, you know, some of the more mature functions that sits um, centrally within as SSC, like accounts payable and accounts receivable, you'd normally have an, you know, a closer um, influence uh, when you try to uh, automate some of your manual processes. But for some of the areas that we mentioned earlier, like being able to identify spend management and creating a more visible uh, way for you to support your sourcing buyers, these tend to um, sit outside of the SSC for those who are early in their SSC uh, maturity stage. So it's really key to really understand, you know, who's involved in the process, how much of, you know, the stakeholder um, are you able to influence um, and how much stake do they have when you start, you know, introducing uh, digital frameworks in the manual processes that you have? Um, now, those are really more the internal stakeholders, right? Uh, the problem or typically the challenges as well that SSCs have is they deal with a lot of external stakeholders as well. Um, and we talk here about, you know, your suppliers and customers. And the minute you think about, uh, you know, introducing digital tools or automating some of your internal processes, you know, you normally have a huge impact to the way your customers and your suppliers also deal with you, right? Um, you know, in my experience in the past where we led, you know, a global initiative of, um, you know, really converting our suppliers to issue electronic invoices, we did a lot of, uh, you know, supplier enablement types of discussions because we had to make sure you know, some the suppliers understand First, 
what they have to do uh, and second why they have to do it right because if they do not uh, see the benefit from their standpoint uh, it will be that very difficult for you to implement any um, of the digital uh, automation initiatives that you have which means you know the layer below that is really how you interact with these stakeholders right um, and again you know the two ways uh, one is internal technology uh, what are the tools that you have existing today very often you know you have a single instance erp um, that is your main uh, record a source of records uh, but you typically have you know separate uh, modules as well uh, to manage you know customers and suppliers um, and depending on how you know tech savvy your uh, finance operations have been in the past few years you may have uh, supplier portals or customer portals as well uh, where you're able to digitize the way you interact with your um, suppliers and customers so this is really just you know if you think about you know the the vision if you if you like to put it that way on where the SSC is, um, how they operate, who they operate with, um, and what are the types of technology that sits beneath uh, all of those operations. Now, what really is the challenge, right? Because we talked about um, who and what would be the areas to automate, but depending on where you are um, and how much centralized your finance operation would be, uh, you would normally have different challenges when you start introducing you know, digital frameworks. And in the next slide, we try to uh, maybe bucket the types of shared service centers into um, like three broad groups, right? Um, you'd have companies who are probably still uh, generally decentralized and then are, are in the process of, you know, centralizing their processes into a central location. And normally you'd be dealing with, you know, a lot of these centralized uh, legacy business units or legacy um technology um such as tools that are being used by one business unit very specific to uh, their business process and normally um in this stage right uh, the priority is really um to centralize and to standardize and you would normally put at the back burner um digitization because you'd be very much uh, entrenched into lift and shift type of um discussions right you're trying to understand what is the um current business process uh, how do you standardize that how do you you know deliver some of the cost savings that's been um, projected for centralizing those processes and you tend to forget that um you know you you want to make sure that you're creating a sustainable framework um for the resources who will operate these uh, business processes in the future so there's really um you know a scarcity of resources for those who are still in this area um, of ssc maturity now, for some of the more uh, mature SSEs where you know, they've been able to standardize, they've been able to centralize, and, and they're sort of in stage one, stage two, where you know, they have their AP teams um, sitting in a, in a central location. Uh, for some of them, they even have a more end-to-end -end, um, P2P or O2C um, you know, operation sitting within the SSC. You'd see that there's a massive... Um, you know, shift towards what we call platformification. Um, typically, you'll see each of the different teams start really looking into their sub processes and what are the heavy lifting that happens, uh, and they start really moving into um, digital tools. Now, you know, while this is great, and what we've heard in the earlier poll, right? You know, twenty-five percent of the folks feel that um, or see that their digitization is done um, by the business units. Thank you. Uh, what typically happens is you end up actually coming up with even more tools, right? So you have one tool to receive invoice, one tool to move the invoice from one workflow status to the next, um, another tool for you to reach out to your uh, suppliers. And it really becomes like a segmented uh, tech infrastructure. Now, you know, what begins to be, you know, a cost efficiency process uh, sometimes actually becomes even more costly, right? Because you end up with multiple tools, you end up with multiple uh, support teams. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you'll probably run into problems of having, you know, one tool talk to the next and really have a full picture of where the invoice sits or, you know, how much of your collections is still outstanding. And then that's really, you know, the, the crux of the stage one to two um, type of SSCs. 
Now, for some of the more mature ones, right, they, they, they have it figured out. Uh, they've been able to digitize a lot of their processes. Um, they're pretty lean in terms of the amount of resources they spend um, for operating you know, finance. They start looking into you know, what's the additional value add service that you have um, or that you can deliver um, to the business, right? Because you know, you've been in the business and delivering cost savings for 10, 15 years. How do you start adding value um, add service back to the business because um, from there, right, they start asking you, okay, how do you now start becoming, you know, like a profit center instead of just retaining um, as a uh, cost center to the business. And what we'd like to introduce is really, you know, of the different maturity levels here, what are the ways for you to um, digitize and how would you, um, you know, influence the way uh, the company thinks about digitization? Um, and in the next slide, uh, there are three ways, right? Um, one is, uh, and this is what you call, you know, augment, supplement, and innovate. Um, and augment is really, you know, being able to leverage off-the-shelf um, technology uh, that's available in the um, in the market. Uh, what this means is, you want to understand um, what are your existing pain points, what are the areas that you still have manual um, processes. And how do you utilize uh, off-the-shelf technology that's made available um, through fintech partners or through some of the um, technology softwares out there um, for you to, you know, have a quick and easy um, type of automation, right? And, and the key here is really off-the-shelf technology, right? Because the minute you start, you know, tweaking technology for some of the very unique cases, what you really end up with, again, is, you know, very bespoke solutions who uh, are not standard. Uh, that's one. And second, becomes difficult to um, support moving forward. So really, you know, you want to understand how much of it you can augment um, in such a way that you'll be able to uh, scale it across the different markets uh, or processes that you have. So that's, you know, that's the first one. Um, the second group is supplement. So we talk, you know, massive platformification where you end up with like 50, um, 80 different tools that you're operating within your uh, procure to pay or order to cash. And you may want to start really looking into how you harmonize all of these different tools. Um, later in, in the session, um, we'll share with you, you know, the types of capabilities um, and integration across different platforms and how you can really harmonize uh, different technology requirements or digitization requirements that allow you to, you know, really simplify the way that you um, introduce digital uh, tools in the system without necessarily, you know, creating multiple um, touch points across the different tools. And the last is really, you know, being able to see what's out there, right? Um, it's been a fairly mature um, industry uh, across the globe. And there's quite a lot of marketing lead, market leading trends already and how you digitize the last mile um, work that SSCs are doing today. Um, and you know, if there's one thing that I'd want you to take away from this slide, it's really more of you know, banks uh, through their in-house uh, technologies and fintech partnerships have really started playing a more active role um, in accelerating some of your digital capabilities, right? Uh, so depending on whether you're looking to augment requirements or you're really looking into market leading trends, uh, banks have really been able to really um, hear what some of the corporates um, have been looking for in terms of uh, automating their requirements. So that said, uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question once more to the group, uh, which leads us to the next poll. Uh, how much of your digitization initiatives uh, are to be augmented, supplemented, or innovated um, in partnership with banks uh, or fintech partnerships. This is definitely going to be an interesting one.
Okay, so we got our results. So majority um, do not leverage banks or fintech partnerships for dig digitization um, or some the other 30% um, utilize less than 20% of their processes with the banks. Actually, that's not surprising. It's, it's sad, but it's not surprising. Um, and really what we wanted to share today is really, you know, how how banks um, have been able to really play uh, a more active role in this area. So maybe we start um, going to the nitty gritty and the, you know, the meat of today's session. So we've, we've cut it up into two main sections. Um, we want to show, you know, how you digitize source to pay uh, and how you digitize order to cash as well in the later section. And when we start with, with this first one, um, moving to the next slide, thank you, uh, Megan, for being a great slide flipper <laughs> for us. Um, and what we really wanted to share here is, you know, like a framework of um, how you want to dissect, um, you know, the different requirements that you have when you think about automating your finance processes. Um, and the first step really, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is, you know, defining um, how much effort is spent on the different um, subgroups um, of the processes you have within SSCs. Uh, and if you think about procure to pay, right, um, across, you know, spend management, invoicing, um, payment, and reporting, a lot of your resources um, based on industry benchmarks are really spent um, in invoice processing, right? Um, and majority of the reason is, you know, not just the volume itself, but the sheer uh, nature of the process, right? Um, if you think about, you know, posting an invoice, one invoice, uh, you'd normally need to go through like eight to 10 different fields. You have to identify the vendor name, the vendor code, um, what's the date of the invoice, what's the due date, all of that. And that's just one invoice, right? So really the nature of the, um, the work itself is very high. Um, or the effort required is very high, which is why, you know, the focus area um, for this type of, or for this sub process is really, you know, how do I make my invoice more electronic? Um, how do I make sure that I capture the right data fields? And how do I make the data information more structured, right? So we really see, you know, the focus area being able to create a structured format um, for you to be able to, you know, process all of your validations um, and later on payment uh, of these transactions more seamlessly. So that's the first step. Second is, you know, being able to identify what the problem statement is um, for each of these different uh, sub-processes. So early on, right, we mentioned, you know, you'd want to understand um, on which part of your operating cycle the challenges are. Uh, and each sub-process really would have its own um, problem statement. And we, if we pick spend right and the way we for sscs today support their sourcing buyers there's really a massive um you know clamor towards being able to visibly manage the spend um that exists across you know the entire supply chain um and you know two ways that um suppliers or sorry sourcing buyers are focusing on here right so we mentioned um spend visibility so they want to understand you know how much of their spending um, sits within preferred suppliers. Um, they want to do this because if you start thinking about, you know, creating an electronic invoice or being able to um, implement some of your supplier portal type of capabilities, you want to be able to do this um, and pilot it with suppliers who really um, house most of your volumes, right? Uh, so you'd want to implement uh, electronic invoicing and some of your um, digital capabilities where your suppliers would be issuing the most invoices. Um, so that's one. Second is where you know that you need to um, support supply chain uh, requirements. You want to be able to digitally onboard your suppliers um, quick and easy, but still compliant, right? So you see a lot of focus of your um, sourcing buyers really be geared towards how do I um, onboard my suppliers um, easily uh, and digitally as well. So that's, you know, two ways for you to understand how you want to create a digital journey. 
Um, but for some of your, you know, low effort area like payments uh, and reporting, uh, this may be low in effort um, in the sense that, you know, when you carry out your payment run, uh, there's typically one payment run um, for the day or for some of the more mature ones that have one um, per week. Uh, but the validation here required um, is really high because the risk um, and the cost associated to non-compliance is, uh, is really high as well. Um, so the way to think about some of these you know, low effort area is trying to understand you know, what is the risk um, and control areas associated with processing these um, transactions. And some of the focus areas that we normally see in these areas are, you know, how do I rationalize my payment channels? Uh, how do I make sure that I pay my suppliers in more um, you know, compliant and safe um, channels? So we still see uh, a lot of the you know, suppliers still being paid in uh, paper uh, channels such as cash um, and checks. And you know, globally, corporates or leading corporates are able to really um, shift their suppliers uh, as much as 80% of their volume into more electronic uh, wire channels as well. And you, know, you can start leveraging the banks on you know, how you'll be able to shift these suppliers as well. Um, so that's really the framework of where you know, your um, digital journey starts. And if we go to the next stage, what we tried to do is uh, superimpose you know, the different capabilities that are now uh, made available through banks uh, in terms of um, digitizing you know, these different processes. So on the far left, um, I know I'm showing here source to pay analytics because we really talked about you know, spend management um, quite heavily with, with sourcing buyers. And banks have been able, through both in-house um, analytics capabilities as well as you know, fintech partners, been able to cut and slice the data into three ways, right? Um, one is analog driven. So definitely there are some parts of your supplier payments who will have to um, remain as checks or bank drafts. Um, there are ways for them to show you um, volume uh, driven types of uh, transactions. So you'll, they'll be able to highlight you know, how much of your uh, transactions could be moved to wires, um, to local um, low value clearing channels as well, or to real time payments. Um, but the, you know, the part that's really interesting is you know, how you'll be able to identify value-driven um, type of analysis uh, back to your sourcing buyers, right? And we'd like to normally split this information into two parts. Um, you know, the first part being how much of your spend sits with your direct spend suppliers or suppliers who are directly supplying to um, you know, raw materials or packing materials related to your um, production. And you want to understand, you know, how do you digitize the way that you provide um, working capital um, options to these suppliers, right? So options like supply chain financing, uh, dynamic discounting. So these are, you know, types of financing solutions that in the past remain to be very, very um, manual in the sense that, you know, you download a list of outstanding invoices that are yet, yet to be paid, um, how much of it is ready to be paid, and then you send to the bank. Um, and confirm that these are invoices that suppliers can start, uh, you know, factoring or applying um, supply chain financing. So there, there have been more uh, integrated platforms where, you know, these types of trade financing types of um, working capital solutions are made more uh, seamless between the bank, uh, the corporate, and the suppliers as well. Now, for some of the more indirect um, type of suppliers, right, where you know you have low value type of um, spend, but you know, a huge amount of your, um, or a huge volume of supplier sits here. You know, we see that there's a, um, you know, a shift towards more sustainable types of um, digital payment methods. So we highlighted here, you know, single use accounts where we see you have a lot of your indirect suppliers who are probably being paid like once or twice only um, in the course of your, um, business with them, right? So you probably have that one supplier that you needed for uh, a very specific project. And, you know, for you to, or for your sourcing buyers to onboard that supplier, it'll take you like three to seven days um, because you'd have to validate all of the requirements and all of that. Uh, but we see that, you know, the, the advancements in 
uh, the way banks have integrated with uh, different digital marketplaces or um, you know marketplaces such as Coupa, Jaeger, um, it provides these uh, digital marketplaces an option to allow suppliers to be paid into single-use accounts where you know they're provided with like a virtual card type of a capability um, or a virtual card type of an account, um, and they're able to receive their funds there. So they don't necessarily need to provide you know corporates with their um, bank account, but corporates are pretty much sure that the way that they're being or that the way that they're paying their suppliers are still pretty compliant because these are single use accounts that's been issued by you know their banks as well. And for some of the you know more um, day to day operational type of spend, you know we see pro cards or procurement cards really being uh, a way for them to digitize the way that they pay some of these suppliers. Now that's that's on the spend analytics um, part, right? And we talk about you know how you digitize um, supplier onboarding and the services beneath that. Um, supplier portal, I think, is one of the um, underrated uh, capabilities. I think it starts off as an idea of, hey, I want to be able to have that online portal where you know a supplier can go in and look at the. Uh, information available for them, how they will become a supplier, how they issue an invoice. Um, but in the recent years, you know, there's a, a shift towards, um, you know, using these supplier portals more than just onboarding, right? So you can start um, embedding some of the um, one validation um, that you put as the supplier provides his um, banking details, right? So in some of the more mature uh, markets like the U.S., um, where there's a, a free flow of information on, you know, what are valid account numbers, you'll be able to actually, you know, validate whether you know the information being provided by your supplier is correct um, at the moment that they are onboarding themselves as a supplier, right? Because the minute that they, um, you know, create their um, profile as a supplier, you're already validating if the bank account that they're providing to you. Um, is you know valid? That's one. Uh, and second, if it's um, really an account um, that belongs to the person or the supplier that's uh, creating their account, so you know it, it becomes like a seamless um, supplier onboarding experience um, with you as a corporate um, being sure that you know the way you digitized it um, is not going to create breaks in the system as well. Uh, Platforms, when it comes to payments, really becomes as an offshoot on how your um, invoice has been created, right? Uh, so we mentioned, you know, uh, your capability to automate some of your workflows. Um, some of that uh, tends to become uh, segmented with how your invoice will be paid. Um, you'd be surprised with how much um, you know, corporates today still manage their payments um, through manual means, uh, meaning they don't have a host-to-host -host connectivity. Um, they still, you know, create manual forms. Um, they feel that the minute they have like performa templates, um, this becomes slightly automated already. But really, you know, you're still introducing human error um, into the process. So there's really uh, a massive shift towards um, identifying how you're really um, initiating some of these transactions more um, automated as well through you know online bank portals um, and ERP adapters. So you know these are just some of the examples uh, that we see integration happening uh, from the way that you create an invoice to the way that you pay them. Um, but in terms of reporting, maybe one thing to highlight here is you know payment run uh, dashboards. I think we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, being able to identify, you know, how much of your transactions are um, flowing from uh, your uh, ERP systems to the banks. Uh, and when we think about payment run dashboards, um, two ways, right? One is, you know, how much of your invoices um, that's been executed to the bank did flow through. Um, and second is, how much of it is reconciled with your bank statements? Um, interestingly, uh, we were talking to um, you know, there are some conversations where we hear um, clients having duplicate payments uh, and they're unaware on how they'll be able to identify whether an invoice 
um, or a transaction has been paid um, twice. And, you know, some of these conversations tend to, um, you know, unearth that there's no um, immediate bank reconciliation that happens on the payment front. Um, they execute the payment, um, they check whether the bank has acknowledged um, receipt of the payment, but they don't really do a real-time reconciliation of um, you know, the payment instructions that has been sent out in the past few days. So your payment trend dashboard really could be used um, in this respect where you, know, you check how much of your transactions has been uh, initiated, acknowledged, and how much of it has been reconciled with the bank statement as well. So this is really just you know, the nexus of um, capabilities that are out there when it comes to improving overall payment efficiencies um, and also being able to create controls um, within your procure to pay um, value chain. So if we move to the next section, in order to cash right, um, in procure to pay, and I think I, I failed to highlight it. Um, majority of the work uh, of the SSE really sits pre-transaction, um, meaning your heavy workload is in processing the invoice, in onboarding the supplier. Um, but once all of that is completed, you know the post-transaction of reconciliation and um, you know initiating the payment becomes relatively lighter, which is actually the, the opposite for, um, for order to cash because we see that a lot of the post-transaction work um, is where you know, the effort within the SSE sits. So you know, the effort to do cash application um, and managing queries and disputes tend to be high. Um, now, what's not very apparent here is that a lot of the cash application challenges actually um, are driven by some of the ways that you create the orders um, and build your uh, customers, right? Which is why a lot of the discussions with, um, with corporates typically is around how do I integrate, you know, the different systems um, that I have from the way I onboard my customer, I send out the sales orders, um, you know, I manage their credit and, uh, you know, identify which ones of their invoices have been collected and reconciled. So there's a lot of um, discussions around you know, integrated order platforms, being able to combine, you know, the way that they issue their uh, paperless invoices um, to the way that they provide, you know, self-service reconciliation capabilities as well. Um, so that's on the connect part. On collection, I think the most um, focus area normally by corporates is, you know, how do I collect on time? Um, and by collection on time here is, you know, what are the channels um, that my customers um, have access to, you know, is it more the traditional uh, payment initiation from their side, and then I wait um, if it's if it um, hits my bank accounts, and then I start reconciling, um, or are there you know alternate uh, modes of payments that are already available out there for some of my more um, B two C uh, type of collections, and how do I shift them into those electronic collection channels? Um, now, depending on how much you're able to clean up. You know, the way that you issue your invoices and the channels that you provide um, to your customers, your cash application and query dispute would be, you know, relatively easier. Um, now, automated cash applications definitely still sits at the heart of um, being able to automate your cash application, right? Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of the um, work being done today for matching matching invoices still is very manual. Um, and later on, we'll you know, share with you, you know, a couple of ways to dice that. But the bank has really started playing um, you know, a more uh, active role in being able to solve this challenge for, for corporates, right? So they no longer just provide avenues for you to get enriched back statement data, um, but they give you tools um, that is you know, very much suited with the type of uh, collection volumes that you have today, um, which later on, you know, makes your dispute resolution um, even much quicker as well. So going to the last slide, um, for order to cash, there, there are two ways really um, to start your digital journey. 
And one is, you know, understanding what are your distribution channels. Um, we highlighted here, you know, like a, a vision of having like a digital commerce um, where you split your uh, customer connect um, steps into three ways. One is uh, digital uh, onboarding for your customers um, and automated credit risk scoring. Uh, so that's the first step. Second is, you know, how do you start shifting your customers into more um, digital marketplace type of solution? So there are now um, more integrated um, ordering that's available between B2B type of um, B2B type of flows. Uh, but for some of the B2C ones, we see, you know, some of the traditional moment, sorry, traditional brick and mortar type of companies introducing direct e-commerce types of sites. Um, so the minute you start, you know, implementing these types of marketplaces, you want to make sure that, you know, the inherent invoicing um, that comes from these types of solution also becomes um, electronic as well. So, you know, it's, it's really an integrated way of um, allowing your customers to order and, you know, issuing an invoice. But at the same time, integrating it with sort of like an omni-channel uh, collection um, options for your customers, right? Because you'd want to leverage the way that you've onboarded them um, in these digital platforms and supplement it with, you know, digital capabilities to pay. So things like um, remote deposit um, or incoming wires or, you know, e-wallets are some of the capabilities that we've seen, um, you know, upticking in some of the uh, more paper-based countries uh, or paper-based regions as well. So we talked about, you know, collections and marketplaces. Reconciliation, um, once all of that happens, uh, I think there are two ways that reconciliation has now been dissected, right? I think traditionally, um, corporates have really looked into how do I automate my internal um, reconciliation tools. So a lot of the ways that, um, or a lot of the automation efforts has really been on, okay, how do I apply rule-based engines? Um, what are the different documents that I receive from my customers? And how do I, you know, make that electronic? So that's, all of that is now um, integrated as well or made available to some of the portals um, that the bank is able to connect to. Um, that that's one. Second is you're actually able, there are now um, capabilities to allow your customers to reconcile some of these transactions themselves. Um, so we've seen, you know, banks being able to provide, you know, the bank statements, one, um, on the available receipts for the day. Um, second is internally, they match it with, based on rule-based engines, um, what are the outstanding invoices? So where there's a straight match, you know, those obviously will be cleared out to your ERP systems. But for, you know, some of your more complex um, reconciliation uh, types of um, scenarios where your customers are paying multiple invoices or we have several transactions that are dispute, um, you know, some of the engines are would take time to learn these types of um, unique scenarios, which you know, some of the porters are now sending out notifications to customers to say, this is the, um, you know, bank statement amounts that we received. Um, these are your outstanding invoices. Can you identify which ones are, um, which ones these uh, transactions are for? Um, and for any outstanding amount, you know, what are they? Are they uh, deductions or are there credit memos that still needs to be matched? So, you know, these types of um, reconciliation tools have now been made available through, um, through bank portals and bank tech partnerships where you combine your internal processes um, with external communication types of capabilities as well. And maybe, you know, the last thing to highlight in this area is, um, and this applies actually to both, um, you know, accounts receivable, order to cash, and accounts payable is really the intelligent forecasting around um, the way you pay and collect your uh, suppliers and customers, right? Um, I think we mentioned um, at the start that, you know, a, a lot of the digitization efforts is really geared towards 
um, helping treasury teams uh, manage working capital requirements. And you know, the minute you introduce um, automation to some of your finance processes, it creates a more um, dependable um, flow of information. That's one. Um, and second, it creates a more structured way for your um, treasury teams to receive information, right? So yeah, they're now more uh, aware of, you know, how much of your collections are uh, converted. Uh, you know, the models that they'll probably putting into their cash forecasts uh, are going to be much more reliable, um, given they understand the reconciliation and the collection patterns are a little bit more structured. Um, and, you know, with some of the payment um, capabilities that you're introducing, um, you'll be able or they'll be able to um, create a more structured format as well um, with the way that they um, forecast their payments as well. So it's really a handful and a mouthful of uh, things that we shared today. Um, now I'm, I'm just cognizant that we have 12 minutes. Uh, any questions from, uh, from the team? or from the attendees today. Hi, Ryan, we've got a couple of them that have come in. So um, the first question, are all fintechs sufficiently global to be relevant to large multinationals who don't want to engage with regional players? Uh, I don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but I think the answer is um, no. So there are some, requirements that remain to be region specific right so as an example um if you're looking at the payment area um there are some requirements that remain to be uh region specific such as latam um, and apac where you you're required to send you know payment or, or documentary requirements along with foreign currency payments so those would not be um requirements that you would see in emia or US, so you would normally see like a fintech partner who is either you know massively Asia or massively Latam, who is specializing in document uh, workflows and being able to integrate with with the banks to provide these um, these types of um, document uh, digital document submissions. But for some of the other um, processes, definitely yes. So. Uh, as I mentioned, right, if your process is a little bit more standard, meaning it applies across all the global locations that you support, um, then yes, there would be fintech partners that are a little bit more global in nature, depending on the type of process that we're trying to um, automate. And that's a really good question, by the way. Okay, our next question is, why do you think organizations have shied away from engaging banks as a means to digitize their manual finance processes? Uh, th thanks, uh, Megan. I think that's an interesting question. Um, and I think it's really more with the way um, corporates have perceived banks. Um, I think traditionally, uh, banks have been seen as like a solely solution provider, right? So um, they have a question, they want to know what are the payment capabilities or how can I collect in a certain market? Please let me know. And that's really how the dialogue has been, I think, traditionally. But um, banks are becoming a little bit more of a problem solver and they really want to partner with you in understanding what your challenges are, even in some of your upstream processes, right? So banks have also shied, have stopped shying away from um, upstream processes. I think in the past, um, banks would normally just you know, keep the conversations within um, payment initiation or collection channels. But now they understand that you know, if your upstream processes uh, are not clear, then you won't be able to collect um, fast as well. So even if you know you have um, electronic um, collection channels available to them, if they don't know which invoices to collect, um, then it'll basically fail. So you know banks would want the corporates to succeed uh, and have tried to become a little bit more of a problem solver as well in in this area. Thank you. And our next question is, how would you advise corporates to initiate their augment, supplement, or innovate digitization journeys? All right. Um, I think this one, it's really uh, more around, um, you know, starting with the problem statement, uh, like which area um, of your finance process um, really is the most 
um, hit by uh, either effort, um, meaning this is the most manual that you spend your time on, or which areas do you feel um, is most exposed to risk? So we see, you know, some corporates um, taking on cybersecurity types of initiatives where they want to make sure that they're able to validate um, areas that are uh, prone to fraudulent attacks. Um, and that could be an area for you to digitize, right? So digitization doesn't just um, remain in the realm of being cost efficient, but also being able to address uh, like risk and control uh, requirements within the SSEs as well. I think that may be all the questions we have for now. So I'd like to go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. Just a few reminders that you'll receive a copy of the slides in the recording within two business days um, from today's webinar and make sure to take our webinar satisfaction survey when the webinar closes and visit our events page at www.apqc.org forward slash events to learn more about upcoming webinars and events, including our conference coming up um, in the middle of May. And um, the link there to view our on-demand webinars that we have um, previously hosted uh, through APQC On Demand. And our contact information for Ryan um, is here below if you would like to reach out to him and um, to send any follow-up questions that you might have. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ryan. Bye. Bye-bye.